Having K. P. Chen, and after the debate of last weekend, it is P. Chen with a long E. <laughs> Joined Legal Aid of Northwest Texas in 2013 as managing attorney Amarillo and served as Legal Aid Northwest Texas's first for foreclosure prevention team leader. Kay's practice is concentrated in foreclosure prevention and bankruptcy. Kay graduated from the University of Evansville, Evansville, Indiana, and obtained a master's degree at American University, Washington, D.C., before attending law school at Indiana University School of Law, Indianapolis. Kay has been practicing law for 24 years and is licensed in Wisconsin, Indiana, and Texas. So, although Kay is a rescue mom to three dogs and a cat, most of her time outside of work is spent at the barn with her horse, Artie, with whom Kay competed as an amateur in jumping. Now Artie is retired to the more respectable discipline of pasture ornament. Kay Peach. We do have lives outside of law, believe me. <laughs> Thank you everyone for having me here this morning. It's quite a pleasure to be here. I was so excited when Amy asked me to come and, and speak to you all. Um, sometimes when I meet with a group like this, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, but I hope that our presentation this morning will open your eyes and also make some of you angry. It certainly made me angry, but the purpose of it is to bring change. Um, Mike's wonderful song uh, about poor man's house made me think of something. Um, he, in one of the lines said, they'll be poor forever. Well, my goal in life is to try to bring people out of poverty. And that if, if poverty is ended in my lifetime, I, I will work myself out of a job. I'm happy with that. I will rest easy. Um, so that's been my goal most of my career is to try to work to bring people out of poverty, poverty, to raise them out of poverty. And one of the things that has struck me over the last, I'd say, probably 15 years is how segregated our, our lives are in the United States. So we don't think about it. We don't think about how segregated we are in our communities. And part of this presentation, I, I hope we demonstrate how segregated Amarillo is. And like I said, this presentation made me very angry, but it also, um, that anger is part of that fire in my belly that makes me want to change things, makes me want to do something that is going to make change in this community. Um, so I hope you enjoy it, and I'd like to invite you all to ask questions. Don't hesitate, just uh, raise your hand. Um, I like presentations to be interactive, um, so just... If you've got a question, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll um, see if I can not answer it. Can't answer everything, but I'll try. Um, one of the things that my office does is we help low-income people, families, with civil legal problems. Um, you have a public defender to help low-income people with criminal cases. We do the other end, which is just about everything. Uh, we do all kinds of work in our office, and one of the things that we do is housing. Um, we do family law, mostly devoted to clients who are victims of domestic violence or sexual assault. Um, we also do uh, social security. We do all kinds of fun things, and um, I really um, hope that I can make this presentation let you know through this presentation how passionate I am about my work. I love my work. I have the best job there is on the planet. Couldn't ask for anything better. So with that in mind, we'll start. This first slide is just, we're just talking about fair housing and what your rights are in fair housing. Um, our country has a federal statute that says we're all entitled to fair housing. Well, what does that mean? It means you have the right to choose. So one of the things that we see um, in some of the slides is we'll see where all of the HUD-based housing is, all the subsidized housing. Well, we don't want people to um, move to the south side where the opportunities are if they want to stay 
in the barrio or if they want to stay in the North Heights or if they want to stay in Eastridge. We want people to have a choice. We want them to be able to choose where they live. Um, the next thing is the right to stay. The right to stay where you are. You don't have to move. You don't, you don't have to move for gentrification. Um, I, we don't see a lot of this in Amarillo. It's happening a lot in Dallas and Fort Worth and Houston. But we did see this when Interstate 40 went through, and a lot of families were displaced when that big interstate came through. Nobody denies that that brought progress, but it displaced families. And we want families to have a say in that. Um, equal treatment is another right. We want people to be treated equally, whether they live on the south side or they live on the north side or the east side. And we want people to have a say. So these are the four core principles that our office is trying to work toward for our community. This map is what made me angry, one of the maps that made me the most angry. You'll see on this map, can everybody see that pretty well? Okay, the blue dot, this is from the census map from um, 2010, and then there are the American community surveys that are done every year with that stated information. Um, the white dots are blue dots that are Caucasian. The green dots, which you can barely see, are pretty much cut to the open the red dots. Asian are the red dots. And then the gold dots are Hispanic. And this map really, I knew this was happening, but it, it didn't, it wasn't concrete until I saw this map. That Amarillo is so segregated. We live in our own little world. How many of us go from our home to our work and then we go back and forth? We don't ever vary outside of our neighborhoods. There's a whole world out there. There's a whole world to explore. But the same for those families too. This map is from the census and the American um, Community Surveys 2015 that shows um, those blocks are census tracts. This is the city of Amarillo. And then you see these white these blocks in here, those are census tract blocks. The three blocks there are the Barrio, the North Heights, and San Jacinto. So this is the Barrio, the North Heights. So you see how segregated our community is by this map, too. I should tell you the reason why we um, prepared these presentations is um, our firm now has three people in our office just working on community development projects. Uh, the program is called the Community Revitalization Program, and I really don't like that name for several reasons. Um, another reason was pointed out to me today, but I don't like it because I don't like the word revitalization. It brings to mind gentrification, and that is something that a lot of folks in low-income neighborhoods are afraid of. And also the acronym spells crap, so I hate it. And it ju I just, I really dislike that. Uh, but anyway, I, I wasn't the one who came up with it, but I call them our community development lawyers. We've got two lawyers in our office now who are working just on community development. And um, they also have a paralegal working with them. And the purpose of this presentation that we did for a um, housing forum in January was to bring the community together, show us where we are, and then make the community start thinking about where we need to go, what we need to change, how we need to change, how can we bring progress, how can we bring some of our low-income communities into play where they can be, they can get some of the good things that are happening in the rest of the city. So that was the idea behind this. And it is meant to make people angry. It is meant to make people think because we want to make th people think so we can figure out what can we do here? What can be done in Amarillo? We don't need to know what Houston's doing. We don't need to know what Austin's doing. We need to find our people here and find our voice for change. Okay, this one scares me. This is the, um, the darker areas are the higher poverty populations in Amarillo. So the darkest areas, and you can see the Barrio is, and the San Jacinto are pretty much all 
in the high poverty areas. But you see the North Heights, the red box up there, some of that is vacant land up in the uh, left-hand corner there. One statistic that is on this um, on the, the slide is that in the United States, 13.5 percentage of Americans are living at or below the federal poverty level. 17 percent of families in Amarillo are living below the federal poverty level. So our percentage is even higher than the federal level of poverty. Um, Potter County itself, it's not on this slide, but Potter County's poverty level is 22%. 22% of families in Potter County are living in poverty. Um, what that means is a family of four would be at poverty if their, in, their family income is $24,000. So Potter County is one of the highest in our service area, which is the 20 counties of the Panhandle. I can't remember what Randall County's is, but it's, it's starkly lower than that. So it's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty scary uh, percentage. Just to give you a, um, a little bit of context, I came from Indiana and um, worked, I was on the board of Indiana Legal Services there, which is the same kind of organization that my firm is, uh, funded, funded by federal money and state money to help poor people with legal problems. Um, the highest percentage of poverty in, the, in southwest Indiana for a county was 14%. So here we're talking way over what even a small county in Indiana is. <clears throat> um, I would say, I don't know these percentages off the top of my head, and I, I didn't prepare it, um, but the number of children living under, in poverty is even higher, and the number of seniors living in poverty is uh, just astronomical right now. Okay, median household income. So you've got your dark color are the higher income. The lighter are the lower income. And you can see where San Jacinto, North Heights, and the Barrio fit in there, with um, the 80,000 to, 80, to 100,000 being the dark, or above, being the dark areas. Okay, here we get into some of the housing issues. Percentage of renter-occupied housing units. So the darker areas are the, where there are higher percentage of people living in housing rental housing rather than ownership. And you can see well, the airport doesn't come. But this is what Higher ownership, we all know what neighborhoods that is. Zoning, we won't get into zoning. Um, environmental hazards, that's another focus of our community development lawyers. They're, um, they're focused on housing, environmental justice, transportation, and then they do help. They help nonprofits with um, issues, all kinds of work for nonprofits, transactional work. Um, so we have a few things that might be considered environmental hazards within our city limits, but there are very few. This is really, really not bad compared to Austin or Dallas or Houston. Um, I know Dallas has got a cement plant that. Um, is causing some problems with housing, low-income housing in Dallas. Vacant housing units, you can see the darker is the higher number of vacant housing. You can see in the Barrio and North Heights, that number is pretty high. Unemployment rates, the darker the patch, the darker the, the block, the higher the unemployment rate. How many know the unemployment rate right now, the, what they're saying is the federal unemployment rate? It's in the, it's below, it's like 4%, something ridiculous. This block right here, the darkened is 9.14%. Of those folks who are unemployed. And you can see where our highest unemployment rate, our highest unemployment population is. This is another one of my pet peeves. Or have I told you all my pet peeves yet? Well, there's crap, <laughs> and then this is another one. <laughs> okay, this is what we call a food desert. Those, the areas in brown and beige, 
those neighborhoods, there's not a grocery store within a mile. Yes, ma'am. It is up here in the corner. It's actually, uh, you see where that blue triangle or, um, I can't point all the way back <laughs> it may show up on one of my maps, but it's up north of the airport, or not north of the airport, it's up in that corner before you get to the airport. Isn't that right, Amy? Okay. <laughs> okay, this is another one, another, so my third pet peeve for the morning. Um, I'm the, I was, I'm not anymore, the um, team leader for our office's foreclosure prevention project. And one of my things is, what, where are loans going? Where are private loans going in, in our community? This, these are federal loans, federal um, FHA loans, the Federal Housing Authority loans. These go to low-income people. Where are the highest number? Who would want to hinder or uh, give me a guess? The darker areas mean more dollars in federal housing, OK? The lighter areas mean less dollars in federal housing. So you can see where that money is going in Amarillo. And this is, it shows um, the uh, racial demographic for that distribution too. So the darker area means it's white and the other area, the lighter areas are non-white non -white folks and that loan distribution. Conventional mortgages. So you go to a bank or you go to a private lender. Where are they giving? Where are they lending? It's not in the barrio and it's not in the North Heights. All of that money is going outside of our low income areas. So this is one area where we're looking into trying to figure out what is the reason behind this. Why are all of the federal loans and reg or private loans, why are they going to other places and not folks in the barrio or the North Heights. So we're trying to figure that out and figure out whether it's um, racial bias on the part of the bank, low income bias on the part of the bank if they're doing what we call redlining, or if it's the folks in the community aren't making the effort to go to the banks. We don't know yet, so we're working on that. Um, and then again, this is the uh, racial overplay of overlay of the conventional mortgages. Home improvement loans. Where's that money going? Well, you can see a whole bunch of that money is going to the North, or, um, San Jacinto, which is great. <laughs> um, but still, there's more money going other places other than our low-income neighborhoods. But it's, it's not just low-income. It's all There's also a racial bias here. So we can see that on the chart. Um, this one is a little complicated, but we wanted to see where the CDBG money is going. Does anyone know what CDBG is? It is Community Development Block Grants. This is federal money from the um, Housing and Urban Development, and it comes to our city, and it is distributed by our city through a grant-making process. So people apply for grants with the city for this federal money. It's supposed to be for community development. So where is our community development money going? The blue is about the 12,000, or not 12,000, this is millions of dollars. So they're getting some money. North Heights area, the northwest corner is getting some money. The green area is our southeast corner, but most of the money I wouldn't say most of it, but a big chunk of it is going to the southwest side of town. So this is money that goes to, like, uh, for instance, the Wesley Center gets some of this money. Um, other organizations like the Salvation Army may get some of this money. Um, so where is all this money going? Well, we broke it down. We went through um, a number of years. You can see that our our designer went from 1975 to 2013. He just could not stop looking at this stuff. Um, and we saw that a lot of the money, this chart isn't as easy to read as this. This money went to street paving. Um, that is demolition and clearance. So when they have 
buildings that they want to tear down, houses that people aren't living in, the city will put some of that um, CDBG money into tearing things down. Home buyer assistance, look how small of a piece of that pie is going to the northwest side of town. You can barely see that sliver. But they're getting a big part of the pie here on water and sewer improvements. So this is just a, showing you for the last many, many, many years where this community block grant money is going. This one, okay, here's my fourth pet peeve, <laughs> sidewalks. <laughs> one of the things I hate about my neighborhood is I couldn't get to my neighbor's house if I were in a wheelchair, I couldn't get to her house from my front door because there are no sidewalks. There's no sidewalk, there, the street goes like this because we got the rain gullies here, and the, so the street is is has that little hump in it. It it the sidewalk, the lack of sidewalks just drives me crazy. So that little yellow line at the top, that is an unpaved road, and this is in the north, just the North Heights area. All of those red blocks are unpaved streets. Un no side. I mean, not not unpaved streets. I'm sorry. Um, no sidewalks in those areas. None of them. Now look at the barrio. Here's the barrio. All those yellow blocks don't have sidewalks. So this is something that we are working with uh, Disability Rights Texas um, with our community development project. Disability Rights Texas has a big interest in where people can, how people can get around in Texas. Um, so we're partnering with them on this project. This is something that we are um, investigating as a possible civil rights case. Okay, here we're going to get into the other thing that makes me really mad, schools. This map shows the different schools in the city of Amarillo. Now, there are a couple that are outside of Amarillo. You can see we put Bushland on there, and I'm not sure what that other little green one is down here on the south side. But these are all our different schools, and what we did was we made them color-coded based on the student achievement, student achievement index, and this is based on Star Reading and Math Score. So the dark red, or brown, like this one right here, are the lowest achievers, have the lowest performance on the Star test. The dark green have the highest. So where's all the green? Where's all the green? Southwest side of town. So do we know why that is? Well, I can tell you one thing. In this country, many of our school districts are funded by our property taxes. It's one of the most inequitable ways of funding schools there could possibly be. So you've got more money from property taxes coming into these so has our, our school district distributed that money equally? We don't know. But we know that those schools aren't performing, that are in the lower, um, the lower property tax areas. The poor communities are getting less money. Now I think, I'm not sure which green blob, it's that green blob and the north heights and the red box. That's part of it. So this one makes me mad. I've been trying, I've been fighting for school funding equity for 25, almost 25 years now. And there are some communities that are changing that so their funding isn't based on property taxes. It's based on another tax system, but not Indiana and certainly not Texas. Okay, this is a um, kind of complicated one that shows school attendance. School attendance is higher in some of the areas. Um, Middle school attendance, high school attendance. Okay. This map shows us by the little green dot all of the families who have a Section 8 voucher. Do you all know what a Section 8 voucher is? That's when somebody has applied to HUD, Housing and Urban Development, and they're getting subsidized housing, but they can take that voucher with them. So they could rent anywhere where the landlord will 
take that voucher. And then their part of their rent is paid by the city. So it's a mobile thing. They don't have to stay in one apartment complex. The little gold ones like this, those are apartment complexes that are HUD. So those apartment complexes receive, um, the whole complex receives HUD housing. Those are what we call low income tax credit housing. Okay? So these guys are a private, now the gold ones are private. So these are, they get HUD, uh, these are totally private housing. But the developer for that received a tax credit. So they went to HUD and said, we want to build a housing unit somewhere, and we're going to make some of that housing low-income housing, but not all of it. So you'll see there's one, there are a couple down here, there's a couple up there, and I believe this is around the Davis Bridge, this is way down south. Well, that one is over, you all know where 27 hits the, um, the loop. And there's a love station there. It's Hollywood Road. That is right behind that. And we, we think, we're not sure about this. Um, we haven't got anybody on the ground there yet. Um, we think that is a lot of seniors. Um, so you can see in some of our areas, look at San Jacinto. There's a huge amount of vouchers in there. So there's a huge amount of, of rental housing in that area. So you look at that. And... You wonder, okay, so let's say this is a low income person and they want to move from somewhere up the East Ridge or to the Heights or the Davis Bridge and they want to move down here where the schools are better. The buses don't bring them home. Even if you could ride the bus, you'd have to get up at 4 a.m. to get your kid to school to get to work on time. Your kid would be sitting outside because they get there at like 4 or 6 a.m. Um, so then we've overlaid these schools with these areas, too. So you can see the um, where the different housing properties are with the um, a school districts, the school building, where the schools are, all the individual schools. So these are the vouchers, and this is the Section 8 that I talked about. That's, these are where these folks are living. there yeah, with a housing voucher. We've already done the grocery stores. You've already heard my rant about that. <laughs> now, I, I do understand that um, Square Mile Community Development is working on a neighborhood grocery store for San Jacinto, which is, I think, closer to one of the Uniteds. But it is terribly difficult to get a grocery store, a United, to build in some of these areas because they just don't see the profit in it. I saw a neighborhood Walmart go up um, just off Coulter. Well, do we need another Walmart down there? No, we need it up in the North Heights. We need some place where people can get fresh, grocery, fresh vegetables, fresh fruits, um, and not just the fast food stores or the um, Toot and Totems where you can get your potato chips and pop. Bus routes. Okay, I just I just ranted about the bus routes. Okay, so here's where the housing unit is. Where's the bus stop going? Or bus route going? Here. Does anybody know where the Department of Public Safety is now? Do you all know where that is? Where you get your driver's license, you get your ID to vote? Okay, so where is it? Let's see, I'm trying to find 40. There's 40. So it's way out here. Where's the bus route in? The bus route is a mile before that, that um, office. So you have to get off the bus on the north side of 40, and then you walk under the overpass, walk down Interstate 40 for a mile until you get to that DPS office. 
Now, the Social Security office is down here. I believe that is it right there. So people can get to the Social Security office, but it's going to take you two hours. It takes you two hours to get home. We have veterans, um, clients who are veterans, and it can take them all day to do one half hour appointment if they have to ride the bus because they got to take the bus from where they are, go downtown, and then get another bus to go all the way out to the Medi Park where the VA, the VA isn't at the Medi Park, but it's pretty close. That's right. They might have to walk on the street or ride their wheelchair on the street because there are no sidewalks. Um, so this is something our office is working on. And we've been told by the city that there is going to be a bus line. They will expand out to the DPS office. We haven't seen it yet. They have told us that they are going to make the bus route so that there will be changes, places where you can change in between from where the um, hub station is downtown, so you won't have to go all the way downtown to take a bus somewhere else. Um, and they've also told us that they're getting some new buses, so there won't be just eight routes, there may be additional routes. And we're like, okay, well, what's that saying from that movie? Show me the money. Show me it, show me it, show me it. One of my things in my office, everybody knows I have these rules. Well, one of them is trust but verify. <laughs> I want to see it. <laughs> Okay, here we are back at the, um, the population, or the uh, racial um, demographic map. And you can see that red area. Who was there on team where it used to be? That red area up there in the right-hand corner, that's where it used to exist. So you're probably wondering, okay, you've been talking about all this and told us you're angry. Uh, now you've made me angry. Well, what is our office doing? Well, we represent folks in civil matters. Most of the work that we do is individual clients, individual cases. Um, but some of the work, like I've said before, is, is being done by our community development office. So they are focusing on big issues like this. Uh, we had a housing forum in January, and that was when we did this presentation. And we had a really good turnout from community people, um, I mean, community agency people, and also just people who live in our communities. Um, there were people from the Barrio. There were people from the North Heights. There were people from um, Eastridge. There were uh, refugee uh, representatives. So we all got angry, and we all started talking, and we're going to have a follow-up community development forum in, I believe it's going to be in May or June. And, of course, we'll get the word out to folks. Um, so the next step is to figure out, okay, what do we do with this information? How do we take this information and put it to good use? How do we get people to understand that this is going on? Um, James Allen at the city was one of the people who was at our January forum. So he was aware of what we were showing and what we're doing. But James isn't with the city anymore. So we're, we're working on those connections and um, trying to work with the city to address some of the issues. Of course, they can't address everything. We're not looking at the city for money for everything. Um, so the, at the Community Development Forum, what we hope to do is have people come together and we're going to have some sessions on hear what other people around the country are doing to address issues like what we're seeing. Let's talk and then we'll break up into sessions and we'll talk about what might come from our community, what we might do, because it really needs to come from us. It needs to come from the people who live here, not Austin dictating to us or, um, or Dallas doing what Dallas is doing. But those are things that we're working on and we want to involve the community in. We want to bring people in. It's one thing for a lawyer to stand up here and talk about all of this. But what we need to do is put it into action. And that isn't something that a lawyer can do. We need the community behind us. We need the community to help us. Um, so if I have just a couple more minutes, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about some of the other things that we're working on, um, not just the big, big, big picture. picture. Uh, we, have, we go out in the community and we... Um, will speak like this to any group of folks that want to hear us talk. We can also provide education. Our lawyers can 
uh, give presentations about any kind of legal topic. We call these community legal education. We've started calling it the People's Law School. Um, so we want to educate the people about what their rights are, what their obligations are, too. So we, um, for instance, one of the things that we do is we will go to the Salvation Army and their transitional housing program, and we talk to those folks about landlord-tenant rights, but we're also talking to them about home ownership, budgeting, um, consumer issues, so that they can prepare to move out of poverty. The goal of some of those programs is for them to get into stable housing where they don't need HUD, they don't need assistance. Maybe they're gonna buy a house. Um, so we'll go and, and speak to folks and, and try to get, get them information. Information is power, and we all know that. Everybody in this room knows that. So that's one of our, the things that we do that people don't know that we do. So if any of you would like for us to come out and speak to a group, we'd be happy to. And we can speak about all different topics. Um, the other thing we're really excited and I'm very proud of is we are um, in this is our second year for our driver's license clinic. We are helping people who have surcharges on their driver's license, which causes it to be expired. Uh, we're helping them get waiver of those surcharges. Um, so far between um, July and the end of the year, we had helped 126 people waive the surcharges on their driver's license so they could get their driver's license reinstated and then they can drive all over Amarillo, get to work, get their kids to school. Um, the amount of money that we were able to waive was $42,000 um, and that was 126 people. So we do that um, clinic, we have people come to our office on a Saturday morning and we sit down and we go over their paperwork and then we upload their paperwork into the um, DPS website and um, we do that we were doing it every month now we're doing it every quarter our next one is April 28th and we have I think it is 30 people signed up for that clinic already um, so we're we're trying to get the word out about that um, as you can tell in Amarillo with our limited bus service you really have to have a car and we find that a driver's license is one of those impediments to em employment. Um, if you don't have a license, you're not, you may not be, I shouldn't say you're not, you may not be a reliable employee um, or getting your kids to school. That's also a difficulty. Um, so those are a couple of the things that we're doing that folks don't know a lot about, but we're happy to share the information. Um, I thank you very much. Thank you for letting me come to your service today. And thank you for letting me speak to you about this today. And um, if you have any questions, please ask. If you want to talk to me later, call me. Amy's got my information. And I appreciate it. Thank you.